female consorts are associated with different forms of sacred speech and writing. So they do have specific female, female energy of um, insight or the realization of emptiness is associated with the, with the ability to reveal. So this is a world that is gendered in the ways in which awakening is expressed. But in the life of Sarah Quandro, having a consort meant having a male partner. And this is important because we so rarely hear about a female agent with a male appendage. And that's, what, that's what's happening pervasively in Sarah Condro's writing. And we also need to understand that she was pushing against a kind of dominant paradigm when we're thinking about how often she denigrated herself. She's, she's saying a lot in this book, in her life story, that she's worth being a treasure revealer, that male partners are not just um, frivolous, lust-filled play for her, but they, they have a spiritual purpose in her life. I'm Olivia Clementine, and this is Love and Liberation. Today our guest is Sarah Jacoby. Sarah is an associate professor in the Religious Studies Department at Northwestern University. She is also the co-chair of the Tibetan and Himalayan Religions Group at the American Academy of Religion. She is the author of Love and Liberation, Autobiographical Writings of the Tibetan Buddhist Visionary Sarah Khandra, co-author of Buddhism, Introducing the Buddhist Experience, and co-editor of Buddhism Beyond the Monastery. Tantric practices and their performers in Tibet in the Himalayas. Currently, Sarah is working on a full Tibetan English translations of Sarah Kondro's autobiography, among other projects. Well, first of all, I'm so delighted to have you. It feels like you couldn't have been on this podcast until now. Like we needed a few years so then we could truly delve into love and liberation. So thank you so much for being willing to, to take your time to be here and everything. Thank you, Olivia. So we had spoken about uh, what to begin today's conversation with and you had suggested that it seem only reasonable that we talk about the the fact that your book is titled Love and Liberation and this podcast is titled Love and Liberation and, and why did we choose these words? And so I think I'll begin just so then we can dive fully into you and, and your work and Sarah Condro. Um, I mean, don't we all want love and liberation? I think that's, that's at the heart of it. And yet we do so much to go in the other direction. That's really fascinating to me. To me, love and liberation are the most interesting, uncontainable topics and impress upon everything. They color our perception. So I'm interested in the ways that they support each other, potentially inhibit each other, the ways that they're the same and different. I mean, can, can you have liberation without love and can real love come without liberation? So, I mean, I'm interested in the pathway of love as a means for liberation. And at the heart of these words, it truly intrigues me the amount of power we each hold and, and what we do with it because we have such unique paths. I chose those words for this podcast, both in the relative and the ultimate sense, like the ways we experience relative everyday liberation from previous bindings into more connected and satisfying states. And then also the ways we come to a more liberated state of complete openness without self-focus. This podcast kind of straddles both the relative and the ultimate. And what is it to bridge the two? And that's kind of why we have so many different guests on the podcast, because 
for me, often as one of the many people that aspires for ultimate liberation, it can feel so distant and unrealistic, like the virtues that we have to attain within ourselves. And the, um, sometimes it can just feel like an impossibility. And also there can be so much misinterpretation of ultimate liberation, which is why on this podcast, we invite all of these wisdom holders that can, we can really as humans start to have pathways to access both relative and ultimate liberation to have better daily lives, uh, more connected, more satisfying, and then still hold that what's what makes us human, the ultimate aspiration of a human, of this kind of selfless, um, free of blockage inhabiting of this world, because that's what I would hope our world would benefit from most um, in terms of a, a better future. You just expressed all of this so beautifully and so profoundly and with so many layers in the way that I find it most inspiring that I actually feel like, yes, <laughs> my response is yes. <laughs> um, just that, as she said, <laughs> I think we do, we are name buddies then in the sense that we've chosen the same name for our productions for reasons that I think are very similar. Um, when I think of love and liberation, I can't imagine two things that are better. There's something all good about both of those. Um, I think I chose this name. First of all, I need to give a shout out to Anne Klein, who is a Buddhist studies scholar, because I think this name was originally suggested to me from by Anne Klein. Um, the earlier name for this book, when it went to press, I think was Liberation Through Love. And Anne Klein made a point to me that that's limiting right? Because it implies a certain relation between the two words and that it would be more expansive to see it as an and. And ever since she said that in a review that came to me from the press, it just hit that this was the right name. Um, so it came through a process inspired by others as most good ideas do. Um, Love and liberation to me is about, it's a, it's a corrective in a certain sense because the Buddhist path is often understood or even we could say misunderstood as a path in which you cut attachment to everyone and everything and you become a kind of neutral automaton resting in a state of awakeness. And I think the path to liberation is one in which you cut attachment, but compassion and love come with this realization of emptiness and wisdom. The two, the two merge together seamlessly. And I think it's useful to listen to the life stories of those who have come before us and lived really profound Buddhist lives because we hear not just a kind of voice of a neutral automaton, which is, a, which is not a human voice, mm -hmm. right? Um, we hear this profoundly um, feeling voice in the life of Sarah Kondro and one that is deeply enriched by profound love. And I think that's important for us to pay attention to and, and maybe rethink what this path to awakening is actually about. Um, I also see love and liberation as operating on two different levels. You just mentioned the relative and the ultimate. And I think when we're talking about love, we're talking about relational um, interactions in the, the relative world. And 
I think that what I'm trying to say by calling my study of Sarah Condro's life, Love and Liberation, is that her primary relationship with her guru, Dreme Yosser, is both her path to liberation as well as a relationship of profound love. And this is also intended to be a corrective because there's a tendency to understand relationships between people in Vajrayana Buddhism or in Tantra as purely instrumental in nature, um, taking something from a consort in order to internalize a certain type of spiritual insight, for instance. And we rarely hear uh, a kind of consort relationship portrayed as mutual. So one of the kind of claims that I'm trying to make in Love and Liberation is that Sarah Kondro represented her relationship with her guru uh, in the traditional paradigm of guru yoga, but also as a kind of mutually fulfilling, profoundly loving relationship. So I think we can see this as both religious and maybe what we would think of in secular terms as, as a meaningful love. That's so beautiful. There's so many things from what you're sharing right now that I'd love to uh, pull threads from. The first part that you're sharing, this piece of where does love and emotion, this unique sharing that Sarah Condro has in her, in her autobiography, where does that fit into the path of enlightenment? Because so many of us see it as something separate or something to get beyond. I think one of the most profound things about Sarah Kondo's autobiography, I mean, first of all, that it exists at all is profound because so few women wrote the stories of their lives mm -hmm. in Tibetan. Um, she had to cross a lot of barriers in order to feel like her life was worth writing about. Um, but beyond that, what she chooses to say in this very long 407 folio long handwritten manuscript that is actually right in front of my eyes <laughs> as I'm talking to you. Um, it's about the path to liberation that we hear in many other Tibetan masters' life stories, but it's also heavily about the everyday world in which she lived in the early 20th century in Eastern Tibet, in nomadic pasture lands, in Golok primarily. And in that everyday world, we hear a lot about emotions, a full range of human emotions. And this is actually one of the elements that I find the most profoundly inspiring about Sarah Kondro's life. She writes about these beautiful visionary experiences she had traveling to Buddha fields, which are also extraordinary in so many ways. But what is even more rare and more of a kind of unexpected element that doesn't fit the genre specifications of what it means to write an autobiography in Tibetan is how emotional it actually is. And it's not just love, it's also profound grief, which I see as part of what motivated her to write. And we can talk about that more if you want to. There are also other unexpected emotions in there, things you really don't think would fit into the paradigm of a woman, a visionary in Tibet who attains enlightenment, such as jealousy and rage. This is, this is raw, it, it is human. And for me, that's the most inspiring element of it because if Sarah Kondro was really a human, and was able to have all these wondrous visionary experiences and attain enlightenment, then that's profoundly hopeful for the rest of us. 
right? Who yeah. also experience these um, unsavory human emotions. And, and just two more words about the unsavory human emotions and what I mean by that. We sometimes have these overly idealistic ideas that within the inner core of tantric communities in Tibet, everybody was just peacefully attaining enlightenment and surely they were also doing this. But as in all human communities, there were also tensions that arose, particularly between different consorts of charismatic treasure revealers or Buddhist um, lineage masters. And these women were not always very nice to each other. And that really hit me because in my own world, I guess, again, this I found really something I could relate to. And we were just talking about a little bit briefly about academics. And that's another world in which people are not always very um, charitable with each other. So it's very inspiring to hear the challenges that Sarah Kondo encountered. The other one that I find totally fascinating is the way in which she represents her spouse, Gyalse, Gara Gyalse, who was the son of an important treasure revealer named Gara Terchen Pema Dundu Wangjuk Lingpa, which is a very long name, but was a famous treasure revealer in Golok in the early 20th century. And she ends up settling with Gara Gyalse and she has pretty much nothing nice to say about him and an enormous number of quite rage-filled reactions and, and responses. And so this also, it feels very real. This is what I would describe as candor. Sometimes I use that word when I talk about her life writing. I, I so appreciate this. And, and what do you glean as a student of Sarah Condro? I mean, you've been reading her work for years now and continue to be so devoted when you read her sharing of her jealousy and her rage and uh, grief have you taken certain teachings from how in your own life to relate with those definitely um and just one thing about jealousy in her life it was mostly other women that felt jealous towards her um, through speaking to Chatro Sangi Dorje Rinpoche, um, who was Sarah Kondo's direct disciple and met her on several occasions, um, and also through reading her writing and hearing the reactions other people have uh, towards Sarah Kondo, one learns that she was greatly beautiful. She was also unattached. In her words, she says this often, that in Golok, she had no paternal relatives to back her up. This is a direct translation of the Tibetan. And what she means is that she doesn't have male relatives that are in the area to represent her. So she's kind of like a stray person without a bigger family network looking after her interests. This made her experience a lot of insecurity in Eastern Tibet in the early 20th century to be kind of a stranger in some sense. But she was also a threat and clearly perceived as a threat by local women. So, so um, I never really felt that she was jealous. I do feel in many ways that she was angry. So that comes from her. Um, but let's get back to your question. What does this do for me? I think I am a listener and a kind of careful, methodical person. I think what it does for me is it makes me feel like Sarah Condro's life is real because I can listen to it like there's this one moment this is the tiniest thing and in 
enormously detailed, beautiful story. So one might ask, why do I pick this one thing out to tell you right now? But I'm going to explain that it, it impacts me a lot. There's this one moment, Sarah Condro and her friend are out collecting firewood, which is something they did a lot along mountainsides. Um, women carried water and they, they cooked. So you've got to have your fuel, your water, and women in her community also sewed, they made the clothing and they looked after the livestock, they milked the G, the female yak. So you hear about this kind of women's labor in, interwoven into the story. So she's collecting firewood with her friend and all of a sudden now we veer into the supernatural or the profound or however you wanna call it. All of a sudden she intuits that she has a treasure to reveal not far, just a, a hillside away. And she starts going over there with her friend and says, come, we have to go, you know, we have to go over there. There's something there for me. I need to, I need to be there. And then part way as they're walking over to the treasure site, she stops and says, oh my gosh, we can't do this right now. We have to return home right away. Forget this. And she says, my daughter is going to start crying and I gave my two-year-old to my student, Tupsang, and if, if my husband hears her cry, then I'm going to get yelled at. I can't do this right now. Let's go back home. And so the conclusion of this vignette is she and her friend says, but don't you have to go there? Isn't there a treasure to reveal? Shouldn't we keep going? And Sarah Condro says, nope, mm -mm, not happening. Let's go. They return home because of the because of the baby, the young toddler, and that's it. That treasure never gets revealed. And I think about that. I think because in my writing um, and my ongoing translation work, I'm always like, okay, I have exactly 45 minutes to get this done, and then I have to pick up my child. And regardless of whether the work gets done or doesn't get done, I still have to pick up my child. And so this sort of balance that we have between our creative lives um, and not that I'm able to reveal anything. No, I, I do the unenlightened kind of writing, um, but still the creative process that we have to do in fits and starts. And, and we don't always get to just sit around and be creative all the time because there's labor that needs to be done and that balance, I think, to hear it in an enlightened woman's story, mm -hmm. that for me is like, oh, okay, well, if she could do that and still get it all done, you know, not all at the same time. You don't have babies and breastfeed them and take care of them and reveal treasures in the same moment, but sequentially over a lifetime, you can write books and raise babies and write books and raise babies. That's that's deep for me. That's kind of what my whole life is about, actually. What was Sarah Condra's view then of motherhood in, in the field of her spiritual path? So this is a really interesting subject. Motherhood is often denigrated in Buddhist sources, as Reiko Unuma has pointed out largely because mothers were not the authors of Buddhist texts by and large. It was their monastic sons who have had the largest literary voice over the millennia. We don't really know very much about how mothers felt about their lives. We know so much more about how their sons felt, um, worries about them rotting in hell because of their negative karma of menstruation and these things, which are very much from an outside perspective. And that's what makes it so interesting to actually have a chance to read the life story of someone who was a, a flesh and blood mother. There's so many different ways to understand motherhood. We can also expand this out and think of spiritual motherhood caring for others in, in a way in which we don't have to confine it to the biological, adoptive motherhood, 
mentorship more broadly, but, but I think it's okay to have a conversation about the actual labor involved in raising human children as well within that. And in Vajrayana Buddhism, what's interesting is the denigration of motherhood gets flipped on its head and it turns into a valorization of motherhood or of the womb and the female body. I'm gonna read you an example of that from Sarah Condro in just a moment, but I wanna say before I read this that actually it's quite difficult to understand from Sarah Condro's writing how she understood her own motherhood because it is largely outside of the text. It's in between the lines or just, just off in the corner. She doesn't write very much about motherhood. We never hear anything about breastfeeding or, you know, how do you change a diaper? Are there diapers? How do you deal with, you know, the, the reality of babies? Nothing, nothing like that um, is in the text. And so um, what we can glean from that is not that motherhood wasn't part of her life, but rather that it didn't make it in to the story of her spiritual liberation. So um, autobiography in Tibetan, the word is namtar and it means an account of spiritual liberation. It's not a story about everything I did today or how I feel about my life or what my parents did to me when I was young. Um, it's specifically a story that has a telos, an aim. It's a story that shows the readers who are often disciples or people who will become disciples, how it is that this elder was able to follow the Buddhist path as a guide and an inspiration. So you don't hear about things that don't fit into that goal necessarily. So, I get the feeling that in modern writing, we tend to want to make motherhood a part of the Buddhist path in a way that I don't think Sarah Kondo fully does. I think this is cultural. I think it has to do with norms and expectations. So there's so much that isn't said. One thing that Sarah Condro does say repeatedly is she's describing going to do a pilgrimage at Anima Chen Mountain, or she's describing coming home from visiting a Lama, and she uses this pronoun, my daughter and I. My daughter and I came there, my daughter and I went there, right? So you can see that she's not alone. She never just says, I did this, um, or very rarely. She's, she's in relation to a child much of the time. Um, but beyond that, what that relation was like is a little bit harder to hear. As a metaphor, however, in Vajrayana Buddhism, motherhood becomes glorified. And I want to read just one of many instances Sarah Kondra laments to one of her lamas, Gara Terchen, in a visionary experience that her body is inferior and it's so difficult to try to benefit beings as a lowly woman. And wouldn't it be better if she could abandon this body and try to attain a man's body in order to be of greater benefit to others? And there's a lot there we could talk about as well. Um, but the Lama replies, and this is in her vision, don't think like this. This body you have is that of a great female bodhisattva, a mother who gives birth to all the Buddhas. It is the chariot that traverses the grounds and paths, the foundation that gives rise to beings who uphold the sutras and tantras. It goes on. Do you want to hear another sentence? Yeah. Like the source of a river is snow, 
the pure source of both samsara and nirvana is the expansive space of the greatly secret and empty ultimate sphere mother, the space of reality itself in which the energy of compassion goes. I'll stop here because you may not have heard in my English what that is. It's an etymology, an explanation of the word chondro. Ka means space and dro means go. So a chondro, what is that? A chondro is the space of reality itself in which the energy of compassion goes. So this is a kind of vision of ultimate reality that is all happening within the female form, the great mother. So beautiful and, and profound what you just shared. Certainly we could go line by line. There's so much in there. And I'm curious the play just from, from your book and from this passage, that play of female body self-denigration and the play of that, the embodiment of, of being a chondroma and, and Sarah Chondro being both of those. I mean, reflecting on herself as both. How, how does one see that? How does one see her self-denigration and then as well being constantly reflected as this sky goer? There are so many ways to read and to see and to listen. And it will be interesting once the translation that I'm working on of Sarah Kondro's autobiography is published, how readers see and hear this. There's not one right answer, but I think I'd like to share with you how I see it. And that is, I think that Sarah Condro is very careful and very artful in how she writes. And she's constantly lamenting her inferior female body. Mm -hmm. And to hear this, rhetoric, I think will be a little bit off-putting to many readers who will say, oh, you know, we've gone through a feminist revolution at this point, and we don't need to hear this. You know, she's caught up with a patriarchal culture, and I don't think that's what it's about, actually, at all. I think it's a kind of it's a, she's speaking to certain people. We never just tell our stories as neutral scripts, right? We're always speaking to certain people in a certain time, in a certain place. And she's speaking to a culture in which a woman who is not even a nun, who's telling the story of her spiritual liberation is a kind of shocking, almost laughable thing. And, and she's saying, I know that you think I'm just some lowly woman, somebody's wife, but, you know, I know that. I know that this is a, this is a concern, and I'm going to put it out there first, so you don't have to, to say it. But keep listening, because I had this vision, and the stakini came to me and said, that's not how to understand the body. There's this other way. And it's always through another's voice, right? In the passage I just read, it was Gara Terchen who had passed away. So this is a visionary experience of a deceased enlightened Lama and treasure revealer. In many other instances, it's Dakinis who appear before her, Kondroma, in her waking life and her visions. And in both, this kind of permeability between visionary experience and everyday reality. And they counsel her on how we should really see the female body. So whose voice is Sarah Condros? Is it the voice that says, I'm a lowly woman, I should abandon my body and become a man? Or is it the plethora of voices that are speaking have speaking roles in Sarah Kondo's autobiography who are telling us something totally different about the sacred nature of the female form. So there are many voices speaking here. 
Mm -hmm. And that is fascinating. I think that the constant lamenting of the female form is a kind of narrative strategy which occasions the responses that come so readily and beautifully and eloquently, um, lauding the wondrous nature of the female body. However, to call something a narrative strategy implies that it's not real. We have every reason to believe, reading Sarah Condro, that being female was incredibly hard. Women's labor, childbirth, infant mortality, extreme pain, giving birth alone. These things are pervasive in women's lives and um, being yelled at for not showing up at the right time to cook the meal, being constantly put down as an idiot, as someone who doesn't have any capacity to really attain spiritual liberation. These things really happened to Sarah Condro, not to mention being forced into a marriage. She, she escaped it and didn't actually get married. But this is one of the most common tropes in life stories of female Tibetan saints. And it's also real. It's also what happened to many, most girls in Tibet, that they were married at very young ages to people that they didn't necessarily know. So... I want to make sure that when I call something a narrative strategy, I'm also, uh, because she chose to write it in a certain way and to repeat it many times, that's what makes it a strategy and a choice. But it's a reflection of, of the reality of her life, I think. Yeah, I, I just really appreciate you always bringing it back to earth. And you really can feel just by what you're sharing, how courageous she was just by how, yeah, that, that honesty, really bringing it all to the table versus just, just writing a namtar that only showed the divine aspects of her birth and her evolution. I'm wondering if we want to speak of Kandromas and their purpose even more specifically, because that's also something that can get misinterpreted. And, and then also that one aspect of consortship, because certainly that's something um, in terms of the neo-tantra persuasions that are misleading and, and very um, pervasive right now. Would you be willing to share about that? Just giving us a, a general understanding of what is the purpose of a chondroma that you've seen through your research? And, um, and then I don't know if there's a way to demystify or clarify also the, the role of consortship within that. Another important and really vast question. Togo Tundup has written beautifully about the treasure tradition. So I would like to suggest if you want to hear more about what I'm about to say, that would be a, a looking in at Togo Tundup's beautiful writings would be a good place to go. Um, but being a consort is actually part of the spiritual path of Tibetan treasure revelation. There are five things that need to come together for a successful revelation. It, you need to be the right person. You need to be the correct treasure revealer to reveal a treasure. You need to go to the right place at the right time with the right consort and the right doctrine holder, which essentially means student who will receive the teaching and pass it on. And these, these five things, being the right person at the right time, in the right place, with the right consort and the right doctrine holder, when all these things come together, that's when successful revelation occurs. This is a paradigm that's been written about a lot and you in Tibetan, and you see it in many treasure revealers' lives. When I first began reading Sarah Condro, a question that I had about this was this, what do you mean consort? Does that necessarily mean female? How is gender working here? 
if the treasure revealer must have a consort and the treasure revealer is female, then what is it that the consort is bringing? To read Sarah Condro, and this is one view, I'm not saying this is definitive or ultimate, but what it means in the life of Sarah Condro is you need to have the prophesied male consort. So the word consort, even when we say that in English, we often think female, right? But the word in Tibetan, taprok, there are many words, by the way, but, but a, an array of words for consort are not gendered in Tibetan. So it means partner in this process of revelation. Female consorts are associated with different forms of sacred speech and writing. So they do have specific female, female energy of um, insight or the realization of emptiness is associated with the, with the ability to reveal. So this is a world that is gendered in the ways in which awakening is expressed. But in the life of Sarah Quandro, having a consort meant having a male partner. And this is important because we so rarely hear about a female agent with a male appendage. And that's, what, that's what's happening pervasively in Sarah Quandro's writing. And we also need to understand that she was pushing against a kind of dominant paradigm when we're thinking about how often she denigrated herself. She's, she's saying a lot in this book, in her life story, that she's worth being a treasure revealer, that male partners are not just um, frivolous, lust-filled play for her, but they, they have a spiritual purpose in her life. And she says this over and over again. Another really interesting feature of Sarah Kondo's life story regarding consortship that, that I'm still really actively thinking about is as we continue the process of translating Tibetan Buddhism into English, there are certain things that don't translate well, or to use the movie title, that are lost in translation. One of the most difficult things to translate, not just the words, but the meaning, is the fact that consort practices are not just associated with revelation or with the path to liberation. They are specifically pervasively associated with curing sickness and prolonging longevity. So the real reason, if we counted up all the instances in which Sarah Kondo writes about consortship in any capacity, the most often kind of explan explanation that's used for this is about longevity and to translate this and talk about it in English, it's really tough because we in English in 21st century US, where I'm sitting right now in Chicago, for instance, do not have a cultural frame of linking sexuality with longevity. You find it in other spiritual traditions, namely Taoism, and this probably goes back to the same sources I'm not a scholar of Taoism, but it strikes me that tantric systems in South Asia and Taoist practices must have been correlated over time in, in different ways because of these similarities. But once you translate this at all, actually, we have to be careful. Here's where the guardrails go up or the flashing warning signs go up because if someone in, say, Chicago says, oh, you know, I need to have a consort relationship with you, beautiful 20-year-old girl who's come to my Dharma center, that is a problem, 
You know, it's going to be a problem. It is a problem. It is exploding as a problem. And, you know, how many times now do we need sex abuse and Buddhism to appear in the New York Times? Apparently, we need it more because, in my opinion, not enough work is being done on this subject. There's some wonderful work that's starting, but the magnitude of the problems that are emerging are a product of many factors. And one of them is a lack of understanding of Buddhist history. And we need to understand more. What did it mean? And not just projecting our own attitudes and biases onto these texts, but actually to really listen. What did it mean to live in a world in which having a consort was part of enhancing longevity? What are the ethical ways in which this manifests in Tibetan texts and life worlds? What are the unethical ways? How can we learn from this? There's so much more to be understood about how we understand embodiment, liberation, um, how we understand sexual misconduct, and, and on the other side, how we understand sexual ethics. It's quite complicated, and it, it goes down to different conceptions of the body and what it does, and the relationship between the body and the mind, and the relationship between spiritual realization, which we tend to think of as somehow taking place in here, in the head, um, and not the heart inside of the body. And the mind and the heart are one word in Tibetan. So there's a lot more to learn and also other um, Buddhist languages. So that's, that's a little bit more to a very rich topic. I remember from one of your articles, you had uh, a line from a, a text as to, I wish I remembered it verbatim right now. But um, basically what one person needed to do to be ready to have consortship and essentially they needed to revive somebody from the dead. This is one of my favorite quotes ever. Um, it is Toku Tundup in his foreword to um, the book that uh, is called Perfect Conduct in English. And this is a translation of um, what is called Dom Sum literature, three vow literature. How can one person maintain the Pratimoksha vows of individual liberation, meaning monastic celibacy, Buddhist monastic celibacy, the Mahayana vows of the Bodhisattva path, and the Vajrayana vows of Tantric Samaya? How do you merge those? Um, so this is a genre of writing. And Tuku Tundup cautions in the introduction to this book. Sure, you can be a celibate monastic and practice consort practice, but unless you can also raise the dead, then you probably can't do that. <laughs> because it's about being able to practice without being attached to one's own lustful desire. Tantra at its heart is a kind of transformative recipe to take the energy that we humans put towards passion and to use that power to transform it into something pure. So to transform lust-filled passion into wisdom-infused bliss. Lots of people want to feel that they can do that, right? And Toko Tundup's point is not so fast. You know, <laughs> texts do say that people can do this, but that doesn't mean that you can do this or that you are doing this as you go out and about in the world. So watch it is kind of the way that I understand Toko Tundup's point. Mm -hmm. Would you speak about Chacho Rinpoche and his connection to Sarah Kondro and, and your connection to Chacho Rinpoche as well? Because certainly their lives are, are, are mirrors of each other in, in many ways. Chacho Rinpoche came into my life when I was 
20 years old. I did a study abroad program. Um, it was an SIT, School for International Training Tibetan Studies program when I was a junior in college. And in many ways, I would say I went on that trip and I never came back. I literally did come back uh, and did not abandon my family in the way that these great masters did. But my fascination with Tibetan culture, Tibetan language, and Sarah Kondro all started at that time. Was, I was there in, a particular thing that even drove you to be interested in that? It's a very unique area. That's a really good point. Um, I think I've always been trying to understand how to be a lay woman in the Buddhist world. And I think it was really that, especially in the Nyingma context, which is a context that I encountered in the US before I went on that trip. And so these questions about motherhood and sexuality are really central to things that I was wondering about as a young person. And so I asked my teacher, Hubert de Clear, um, and his wife, Nazneen Zafar, uh, also deserves mention in this as they were together. I asked him and his, their home in um, Swayambhu Nath in, the, in Kathmandu on this program that I was doing, I said I wanted to study lay women, Nyingma lay women, and where should I go and how do you study that? And they said, oh, well, you should go to Parping, to Yangmashu, to Chatra Rinpoche's monastery, because he has daughters and his daughters are, are perfect examples of important Nyingma lay women that you could, you could you know, get to know. And that was my initial motivation to go there. What's funny about that in retrospect is that no doubt Semo Saraswati, uh, Chatra Rinpoche's oldest daughter, thought that I was just talking with her all the time because I was trying to get her to introduce me to her very famous father. And I was too young at that time to even understand that. I was just trying to get to know her. Um, so it is a little, it is a little funny to think about now. <laughs> but Chatra Rinpoche told me himself, and it took many years. Now I'm fast forwarding and merging things. When I first met Chatra Rinpoche as a 20 year old, I couldn't really speak to Chatra Rinpoche because I didn't speak Tibetan. And there was, so I needed a translator. And very early on, he said, this is not how I teach Dharma. If you actually care about this, then you should go and learn Tibetan. And if you do that, I'll talk to you. And so <laughs> it was pretty clear from a young age that if this was really interesting to me, mm -hmm. I had to do the work to be able to even interact at all. And it's a huge project, it's ongoing. There's always more to learn being a foreigner and an outsider and not being as eloquent in Tibetan. And it's very humbling and hard, but over a long time, a decade of, of effort, um, he was true to his word. And when I came and tried to speak to him, he tried to listen. And, you know, I'm very grateful for the compassion that he showed me, especially in the early years, because I must have been so awful. He never laughed at me or corrected me. You know, he just tried to understand what it was that I was trying to say. Aww. That feels really loving, kind of like a, like a grandfather, like a paternal sort of Mm -hmm. way of treating a young person who was from a faraway land. <laughs> and I, I'm so grateful. One of the things he told me was that when he was 15 years old, he went to see Sarah Kondro and Sarah Kondro had a vision that Chaturambache's root guru was Kempo Ngakchung, 
and she sent him off to go study with Kempo Makchung, who ended up being his root guru, and that initiated that relationship. Then he came back and met her later and received her treasure teachings from her, and then he came back again after she had passed away in 1940 and received her full teachings from her very close disciple. So, yeah, the, it's amazing that the direct nature of the lineage. We're going like straight to the heart of the matter to be able to have spoken to people who actually knew Sarah Kondro and whose lives were influenced by her pure visions. What are some of the similarities you see between both Chacha Rinpoche and Sarah Kondro? There's a lot of talk about renunciation, you know, that or cutting attachment or going from householder life into homelessness, which is um, an etymology of taking monastic vows that um, sometimes described in that way. But who really renounces householder life and enters homelessness? Who really does that in the direct sense? And very few people actually do that. But now we're talking about two people who really did that in different ways. Chatra Rinpoche was just embarking upon his, you know, what ended up being another 50 plus years of wandering and practicing intensely without attachment to places and people or status and money. And he lived that way his whole life. And Sarah Kondro, though she never became a nun, she never literally went forth into homelessness in the way that of taking monastic vows. She actually did that. She didn't go and live in a nunnery. She left home when she was very young and followed this group of pilgrims back to Eastern Tibet and never went home again. And there's no mention of any letters between her natal family and her in Golok. So as far as I know, she never heard from them ever again. And that's actually really hard for us to understand or even conceive of what that would be like in this world of texting and calling and everybody having a cell phone or even just being able to write a letter. And she literally was homeless. She was a beggar girl who was kind of seen as an outsider and some random illiterate uh, hanger on to the group. And she went from that to becoming this renowned visionary and Lama. And she went from being this noble girl, she was a high status girl in Lhasa, where she was born, to ending up as a servant in Golok initially, mm -hmm. in order to earn just enough to have a sheepskin cloak to wear as a winter coat so she could survive the winter. Very few people could handle that without saying, you know, this has been a great trip, but I think I'm going back to my silk brocade in my multi-tiered estate in Lhasa. But she never thought that. To me, Chatur Rinpoche and Sarah Kondro are a kind of ideal in my mind of what it means to really renounce. If you'd be willing to share one story with Chatur Rinpoche, it would be such a gift to hear, just a firsthand experience, something that sticks in your mind. There's so many things I could say, but one thing is that as a, as a, I met Chatur Rinpoche when he was in his 80s. He lived to be 102. So he was quite elderly in years, but, and he had this face deeply wrinkled from time you know, um, and this incredible white beard that was very characteristic. He had legs that were like a 30 or 20 year old man's legs, very, very muscular. 
And one reason is that he was always moving. He was always walking and going places. He was a real Chatralwa. Chatral, his name means like cut off from worldly activities. He was a wanderer. And as that manifest in his older years in, um, in the Kathmandu Valley, he would get up from his room where he slept early in the morning, maybe 7 a.m., 7.30, depended on the day, and just get up and walk to the car. And everyone would be like, oh, okay. And his attendants would run after him with like a bag of items they might need. And, and he would jump in the car and say, okay, we're going to go to Bari, this stupa that he liked, or we're going to the Yakinyadi Hotel. The Yakinyadi, the owner was a patron of his, or j just, you know, we're going and we're going now. And so I remember this because whenever um, people, or whenever I would want to try to see if maybe I could see him, I'd have to get up at the, at really before dawn and rush out to his monastery, really as the sun was rising to see if I could enter and make an offering or come in and make, ask a question or whatever. It had to be like right away at the crack of dawn because he was going to be out of there. So that's, that's one thing about what it was really like. Could we end on a passage from Sarah Condro? Yes. <laughs> okay, so we'll close today with a few passages from Sarah Condro. I'd like to, since we started by talking about love and liberation, I'd like to read you just two things that Sarah Condro wrote that give me as a reader this feeling of both love and liberation in her words. So it's 1924 and after a lifetime of obstacles, Sarah Condro has finally reunited with her guru, Dreamy Oser, and they're living together at Dartsong, which is a place where formerly Dujum Lingpa had his monastic seat. And his sons, including Drumuser, are living there at this time in 1924. And a letter arrives from Adzong Drukpa inviting Sarah Kondro to go down to Adzongar because he has some obstacles to his longevity and he would like to make a kind of auspicious connection, Dendro, with Sarah Kondro as a powerful Kondroma. And Sarah Kondro, though she had nothing against Adzong Rinpoche, was devastated at the idea of having to leave Dumiosa she was finally, after such a hard life, living with him and delighting in every moment. And she told Tukujimi, as she called him then, at this time, I cannot separate from you for even an instant, like a child circles around her mother. My mind has become extremely attached to you. Hence, if I don't have to go, I would prefer not to. The master, Drumiosa, replied, I too will miss you. If I could never be apart from you for even one day, I would feel extremely happy, happier than if I had a house full of jewels. So I just want to make a point that this is the language of lovers, right? This is, this is about the heartstrings that get pulled when people have to part who are deeply loving each other. It's not it's not a cool, detached story of, or even one about you, utilitarian, like I'm using you for enlightenment. No, you cannot read that with, and come to that conclusion mm -hmm. about their relationship. So as she's actually departing to go to Adzumgar, she says, 
when the master, she calls him the master, G D me, the master himself, something like that. I take the himself out because it sounds weird in English. When the master escorted me, I was unable to part with him and felt misery as if I was going to the realm of the dead, but there was nothing I could do. So I sang a song of sorrow like this, Lord of the dance of co-emergent awareness and great bliss, one who arises in a form body as the method aspect, jewel of my heart, Pema Lendraltsau, that's another name for Jumio Sir. When I am together with you, Without an instant of separation, your joyful smile, soothing words, and your mind's insight bring down a rain of whatever dharma I desire. When method and insight become one taste in bliss and emptiness, I feel inconceivable blissful happiness like being in a god realm. Hero, even though I don't wish to part from you, I must go for a time to another unseen place invoked by the power of previous auspicious connections. Hence, my mind is tormented by misery as if I'm going to the realm of the Lord of Death. Nevertheless, through the aspirations of the Padmasambhava couple and by the pure vows and love between us, method and insight, I pray that I will quickly see your face again. Ooh. Wow. So beautiful. Thank you. It's even more beautiful in Tibetan, actually. I'm still working on the art of translation, especially with metered verse. This mm. is metered verse in Tibetan. And so it has a kind of rhythm of, of song. She described that as a song. How do, how do we make that sing? It's so hard, you know. What is your process? English has more syllables than Tibetan. So to put it in meter in the way that it is in Tibetan, we have to lose some meaning. Mm -hmm. So there's this tension between making it sing like poetry and being absolutely true to every word and bring in the meaning. I think my process is that initially my translations are meaning translations. I'm trying to get it right or not lose anything of the original. And then it's, a, it's an extensive process of multiple revisions to look at the English as a work in and of itself and think, this is poetry in Tibetan. What is this in English? How to make this thing? And that I'm still working on. Mm, thank you so much for your devotion. And I, do you have any idea when your current work of translating her 400 plus philo uh, paged autobiography will come to completion? I've been working on it for a long time and I'm finally feeling like I'm making some good headway. I don't want to give you a specific time because then I'll feel bad if I don't attain it, but it's, it's coming pretty quickly these days. I'm working very intensively on it and I'll need to go over um, this material with some llamas and some people from nomadic areas to check some of my readings, but it's, it's really happening. Ooh, that's so exciting. Thank you so much, Sarah, for your work and really appreciate that you found this pathway for yourself in this lifetime to, to share with all of us. So that was entirely due to the kindness of other people around me. And mm. that is why I appreciate your perspective, Olivia, on relationality as being so important to the different interviews that you do. Because without that, without relationality, relationships between people and understanding that we're not the center of our universes without that nothing can actually happen and and we have to learn that sometimes when we grow up in a culture that is um, individualist in orientation so I am so grateful to have this chance to, to see your Love and Liberation podcast 
and <laughs> Sarah Condro's book in English, Love and Liberation, come together and it would be great to keep talking. Yeah, definitely.